How are you? If you have a Bible, open it please to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at the last paragraph, verses 16 through 20 in just a moment. I'm sure a familiar portion of Scripture to many of us, the Great Commission. Before we do that, let me just say thank you, BBC, for your hospitality, your love of this stranger. Thank you for just the gracious way that I have been greeted and encouraged and loved and uh, just listened to these past four days as we've looked at God's Word. Thank you to your pastor, Doug, and his wife and the elders. Um, As we mentioned earlier in the week, I got to know Doug through Gareth and Carrie Franks, and Doug has preached at our church back home in the States, and uh, we've got some shared connections and shared networks that we're part of. And I'm just thankful. Pastoral friendship is a gift. And uh, it's wonderful to get to know and deepen the bonds between us, between myself and this dear brother and our churches. I want to say thank you also to my wonderful host, the Starkey family. Quinn and his wife uh, have just been gracious hosts and their beautiful children and have just just waited on my every need. And uh, it's just been been a delight to be in their home and to be to be cared for by them thank you for your hospitality for your love of this stranger and thank you BBC you have so encouraged me I will return home Lord willing if they'll let me back (laughs) I will return home encouraged thankful and energized for ministry Let me tell you a couple ways that you have particularly encouraged me this week. And they they may be small things, but they're things that mean a lot to to me and to to a preacher of God's Word. I have been so encouraged by the conversations I've had with you after our meetings. Conversations that haven't just been about sports or the weather or politics or even really the, the coronavirus, as serious as that is. The conversations have been saturated with application of the things that we've been looking at. And it's obvious that this church has a heartbeat for the gospel. And our conversations after these meetings have been infused with considerations of what God is doing in this local church and how he is calling you. And that's been tremendously encouraging. Also, what has deeply encouraged me is that when the service leaders, whether it's been one of the brothers reading a scripture, praying, or even this morning as your pastor was reading scripture and praying, and your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, there's this sort of agreement in the the room that I can sense people under their breath saying, Amen. And And that just makes faith. And confidence swell in a person's heart when they know that there are hundreds of people in the room in one accord gathered together around the glorious good news of the gospel, leaning forward into what God is calling us to do. Friends, that is powerful. That's powerful. And even just when we open the Word and read from it, and I can hear the sound of pages in the Bible flipping. Friends, that, I'm half Italian, and so uh, it was obligatory for me to watch the Rocky movies where Sylvester, you know, Rocky Balboa would run through the streets of Philadelphia and run up the steps and, you know, kind of shadow box. And when I hear hundreds of Bibles flipping pages, I, I just, I want to put on Eye of the Tiger, and I just, I just want to shadow box. Praise God for the sound of Bible pages flipping. Well, Thursday night we looked at the gospel. We pointed our our compass due north. And none of this really means anything unless we understand the gospel and unless we hold fast to the gospel. Friday night we looked at the sovereignty of God and missions and how what the world seems is a contradiction and a paradox. The The word Paul is actually quite comfortable with. That it is God alone who elects and yet the way that God elects It's through the means of the faithfulness of the evangelism and the mission-sending force of his people. And last night we looked at the life of the local church as being central 
being the platform from which God launches missions and missionaries, how our ecclesiology informs, gives way, leads to our missiology. And this morning, I want us to end our time together in this World Outreach Celebration by looking at the simple, clear, great commission that Jesus leaves his disciples and all of us with before he ascends to heaven. So let me read this text and then pray. Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let us pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, your word is inspired, it's breathed out by you. As a result, it is inerrant, it's completely without error, it's true, it's infallible. Because it's breathed out by you and because it's completely without error, it has all authority. It's your word to us, to your people. It commands us, it shapes, it makes, it creates what it commands. And Lord, it's sufficient. It's all that we need for life and godliness. Lord, fasten our hearts to this word. Rather than considering this word as if we are in judgment over it and can decide whether or not it applies to us or whether it has say or hold or sway in our lives, give us the gift of humility this morning as we look at your word, as we humble ourselves underneath it. Lord, this morning, do things that we cannot do in and of ourselves. I pray that you would make any dead hearts in this sanctuary alive by the power of your word, by the richness of your love and mercy, that you would give ears to hear and eyes to see and a a new heart for anybody that is here this morning that is dead in their sins, that needs to be saved. Maybe there are some that consider themselves to be a Christian. Maybe they think they're trusting in Christ, but they're not. They're deceived. By your kindness, Lord, would you cause scales to fall from those eyes? Maybe there are some here this morning that came by invitation and they are very much aware that they are not trusting in Christ. Maybe they don't believe the Christian message and maybe they're just here out of respectful kindness to their friend who has invited them. Lord, by your kindness, would you take just their their graciousness in responding to an invitation that they didn't really want to come to, would you use that to draw them, to open their eyes, to make Jesus altogether lovely so that they would see their need for a Savior and their accountability before a holy God and they would turn from trusting in themselves and put their hope and trust in Jesus alone who can save them. Lord, for my brothers and sisters here this morning, would you build us up in the most holy faith Would you do more than just get us to the end of a missions conference? But would you do things this morning in our hearts? Would you give us resolutions and resolve in our hearts this morning that would have ripple effects in the ministry of this church for months and years and decades to come? Lord, maybe this morning would you call a young person or an old person to gospel ministry, to giving their lives away, for the sake of the gospel amongst the nations. Lord, would you reason in somebody's heart this morning to share the gospel, to not just be somebody that hears the gospel and believes the gospel, but somebody that gives away the gospel. And would you, would you deepen our confidence in the gospel, deepen our hearts in what you've called us to do, all for the glory of your name and for the joy of your people and for the salvation of all the lost that you have called to yourself. Do these things, we pray, we ask, we pray. There's nothing, there's, there's nothing more important than this. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. This message has two parts. Part one is explanation. Part two, 
is application. Part one, explanation. We're going to look at these few verses and I'm going to do my best to explain them and then we'll, we'll look at applying them to our lives. Look again at verses 16 and 17. Matthew, the gospel writer, says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And verse 17, a fascinating verse, it says, And when they saw him, this is speaking of the eleven disciples, Again, Judas has fallen off, so there's 11 disciples. And when they, the disciples, saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Think about that phrase there at the end of verse 17, but some doubted. Who are the some that doubted? Now, was it the, some of the disciples, or was this just a more general phrase? There's some of the other people that maybe happened to be there. Really, were these 11 disciples that were with Jesus during his earthly ministry, that saw him do all of these things, raise the dead, feed the hungry, walk on water, make a a feast out of a few fish and a few loaves of bread? Really? They saw him now resurrected from the dead? Really? Did these disciples doubt him? I think most likely... What Matthew is saying here is that, yes, it wasn't just generally some people who were on the fringes, but it was even these disciples, amongst these 11, that some of them doubted, that they hesitated. The reason why I think that that reference of those who doubted is referring to those of these 11 that are mentioned in verses 16 and 17 is because this same verb to doubt is used in chapter 14 in verse 31 of Matthew's gospel to describe Peter's little faith when he was sinking into the sea when Jesus told him to come and walk to him. This doubt of Peter, though, seems to indicate not so much doubt in who Jesus was, but a kind of hesitancy, a kind of weak faith. And in fact, this whole theme of, O ye of little faith, is persistent throughout the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus often exhorts and admonishes his disciples that they are those of little faith. And so I think for those reasons, contextually, I think it's clear that those who doubted are amongst these 11, these these men who had seen Jesus do these incredible things in these three short years. Think about that and consider that before we move on to the more famous verses in this passage, verses 18 and 19 and 20, that there were men who saw Jesus in his earthly ministry, saw him in the flesh, do all of these miraculous things, and now have seen him resurrected appearing to 500 people for 40 days, and some of them still hesitated. Their faith was weak. Friends, just a a point of, of application here before we get to the end in the application. I am strangely encouraged by this. I'm strangely encouraged. Now there's a balance to what I'm about to say. I, I am not condoning a kind of sinful unbelief. We should fight against that. And God calls us to holiness. And God calls us to have faith. But my point here is, as we look at the end of verse 17, is that Jesus does not cut them off. He doesn't upbraid them. He doesn't even rebuke them. In fact, right after this, He's going to, as we'll read in just a moment, encourage them with the promise of His authority and His never-ending presence. Jesus encourages doubting disciples, hesitant disciples, weak disciples, disciples like us. Remember the man that comes to Jesus in Mark chapter 9 with his son that is is sick, and he says, Lord, you you can heal him. Lord, I believe. What does he say? But help my unbelief. And what does Jesus say to that father who has brought his son? He doesn't say, well, you know what? Go back to the end of the line and come back when you're ready with the right answer of a complete and strong faith. Jesus meets that man in the weakness of his faith. Friends, God uses hesitant people. Now, it's easy to have a lot of faith on a Sunday morning and to put on your church face. But friends, in the middle of the night, aren't there times when we, when we doubt the goodness of God and whether or not God can really use People like us? Friends, the answer to that is yes. In fact, the Bible is full of God using broken and deeply flawed people. In fact, that's the only type of people that there are in the Bible, except for Jesus. 
just do a, a little quick walk through some, some heroes of the faith. Abraham, Father Abraham, who had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. And I am one of them. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just reverting back to my Sunday school days when I actually didn't know the Lord, but I knew that song anyway. Abraham. Think about Abraham, this great man of faith that is mentioned so positively in the New Testament in Hebrews. Abraham, read his story maybe sometime this week. Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, is called by God. God specifically calls Abraham and he says, you're my man and I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make a nation through you. And through you, through that family that will become a nation, I will bless all the peoples of the earth. And just one chapter later, Abraham is going to where God has told him to, the promised land, and he comes across some king, and he's with his wife Sarah, who apparently was an attractive woman, and he's afraid that this king is going to kill him because of his wife, to take this wife as his own, and so he says, hey, honey, I know this isn't real romantic, but let's just say that you're my sister so this king doesn't kill me. Abraham, Father Abraham, lies about his wife being his sister to save his own hide. Not once, but he does it again a couple chapters later. God uses hesitant, doubtful people. That's what God does. We don't have to tell the story about David. We know the story that God uses deeply flawed people. Think about Elijah. Think about Elijah, this great man. I mean... 1 Kings chapter 18 is confidence-inspiring. What's going on in 1 Kings chapter 18 is Elijah is this prophet of God, and he's standing there before the mountain, before these 450 false prophets of Baal. And Elijah is so confident that he's mocking these false prophets, and he's saying, hey, let's have a little contest here. Let's, Let's just build this altar and, 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 and if your God is God, I'm going to call down fire on this, on this altar. I'm going to call down fire from heaven, from the true God, and he's going to burn up this sacrifice. And then you guys do, you guys call on your God, and let's see. This is a kind of schoolyard brawl. And Elijah calls down fire from heaven. In fact, he, 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 he douses the wood with water just to, just to make it extra miraculous. And God burns up this altar that he's built with fire. And then he goes to the prophets of Baal and he says, okay, now your turn. Nothing's happening. And he's mocking them. And he actually says sort of, you know, sarcastically, where is your God? Is he, is he, is he, is he going to the bathroom? I mean, how much time do we got here? To do? I mean, we're talking about boldness in 1 Kings chapter 18. This is God's man. One chapter later, We read about Elijah hiding from Jezebel, moping, feeling sorry for himself under a tree. Friends, that's me. That's me. Um, You know, don't don't superimpose some sort of strength on the visiting preacher. You're getting my best side. Uh, God's been kind to us in our 15 years as a church. But sometimes I'm just ashamed of how fearful I get in ministry. Sometimes I'm just ashamed of how anxious I am. Sometimes I'm just ashamed at how fearful I am of the opinion of man. And yet, and yet God, God uses me, and he uses you. Think about Peter in the New Testament. Peter, Peter, who in the garden is ready to chop off a man's ear. To defend Jesus. And just a few hours later is lying to a little teenage girl at a campfire saying, I don't know Jesus. Who is this man? Friends, God uses hesitant, doubtful, weak, anxious people like us. Praise God for that. And now what does Jesus say to his disciples, some of whom doubted. Verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority is given to Jesus. We read about this earlier in Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. It says, all things have been handed over to me. This is Jesus speaking to me by the Father. 
and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. And so Jesus, earlier on in the Gospel of Matthew, is saying to His disciples that all things have been handed over to Me. I have all authority. And to these scared, hesitant disciples, Jesus is telling them, He's assuring them that He has all authority. Now, I think there are two applications, two ways that we need to take this authority. The first is this this idea that Jesus is our king. He's got our back. He's with me. He is is in charge. He has made all things, and he has authority over all things. And the way I need to receive that is I think about Jesus speaking to my church and speaking to me and speaking to this church is that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, I need not be ashamed or embarrassed of the gospel. We can proclaim the gospel because they are the words of the king. Listen to how Paul writes this about gospel ministry in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. He says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, like so many, peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Friends, this authority that Jesus gives his disciples and he gives his church in the Great Commission is not an authority that we can go command things to come to life in Jesus' name. That's the Lord's business. Our authority is authority to proclaim to every ear that they must believe Jesus. And then the sovereign king will do what he intends to do with our right preaching of the gospel. To some, it will be a message that they hate. It's a message of death. It condemns them. It convicts them. And they hate it. And to some, it's the message of life. And it's the aroma of life that those whom God has put his affection on in eternity past, will smell and they will come to and they will taste and see that the Lord is good. That's the Lord's business. But we have the authority. In fact, we are given the authority to proclaim the word of Christ. And that is no guarantee that every person that we preach the gospel to will come to faith. It's a guarantee that God will do what God will do with his word through us. But there's a second way that we need to take this authority as well. Not just that we have his authority, but that we are under his authority. Because he has all authority, he commands Christians like us, now, two millennia later, to see this and hear this and heed this command. In other words, what Jesus is about to tell us in verses 19 and 20 is not optional. It's not optional for the New Testament church. We can't treat the Great Commission like it's merely one aspect or one option or one offering of the Christian life. Like, oh yeah, those people are really concerned about missions. But us, you know, we're, we're really concerned about, you know, discipleship. Friends, we can't bifurcate those two things. They, they go together. What Jesus is about to say here is the command for every Christian. This is not, what Jesus says here to the church is not like a, a variety of Sunday school offerings that we can choose from and sign up for. We are all soldiers in God's army, and he is the general. So he says, all authority has been given to me. And then what does he say in verses 19 and 20? He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Look at that first phrase there, verse 19. He says, go therefore and make disciples. Go. Go, church, and make disciples. What does it mean to make disciples? It means to clearly communicate the gospel. How does God do the making of disciples through us? By taking our right communication, 
of the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. And he uses our preaching and teaching and sharing through hesitant, imperfect vessels like us. And as we stick and fasten ourselves to the gospel and communicate it rightly and clearly, God uses us as conduits of the gospel to hit dead hearts and make them alive. That's what he's telling us to do. Not to contrive clever strategies. Or not to have all sorts of things that will attract carnal people and entertain them. But God commands us to clearly and winsomely preach the gospel and then God will do what God will do with it. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 6. This is a great promise to the New Testament church. John chapter 6, verse 37. Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. So here's this grand promise that the Trinity, this this covenant of redemption that the triune God has made with himself, this pact of redemption between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. The Father has elected a people in eternity past. And the Son has accomplished the salvation of all those that the Father has elected through His life and death and resurrection. And now the Spirit goes and applies the salvation that the Son has accomplished, that the Father has elected to the hearts. And how does the Spirit do that? Through the church obeying verse 19 to preach the gospel that God will use to make disciples of all nations. So do you see really, I'm not saying this is easy, but I am saying this is simple, that our task as a New Testament church is just to get the gospel right and to get the gospel out. And God will do what God will do with that. And so what's embedded in Jesus' promise in John 6 is the great commission obedience of the church. That's the means of by which God accomplishes the promise of the end that he says Jesus will lose nothing of all that he has given him. Friends, as we do ministry, as we send out missionaries, as we witness to our neighbors, we are part of the means by which God is bringing John 6, Jesus' words, to completion. You are involved in the outworking of the mission that the Trinity has determined to do within itself. Friends, think about that. The sovereign creator God has called us, just people, doubting people like us, into his covenant with himself to save a people. That's amazing. That's amazing. And what a privilege it is. And he says, go make disciples of all nations. We know that word nations doesn't mean nations like we would think of the the United Nations, not, not geopolitical states, but all people groups, all language groups. And what are we to do? We are to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Why does he mention baptism here? Because baptism is, in a sense, a kind of picture of the gospel. He's saying, preach the gospel and then proclaim the gospel through water baptism. What is baptism? What is this strange Christian thing that we do in baptism? What is it signifying? Baptism is a kind of picture of the gospel itself. Think about what's happening when a person is baptized. They are going down into water. Isn't that kind of strange when you think about it? They're going down. Somebody's laying, a pastor and elders, laying that person down into the water, and they're bringing them up. What does baptism signify? Well, Paul teaches us what baptism signifies in the New Testament, specifically in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. He says that we are baptized into Christ, into his death, and that we are raised again in the newness of life. So why water? What's the importance of water? In the Old Testament, water is a symbol often of God's judgment and wrath. I think the most notable example, obviously, is the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, I believe it is, where God judges the world with the floodwaters of his wrath. We can't breathe underwater. If we are underwater, we will die. And so God judges the world with the floodwaters of 
of his wrath. And what's happening on the cross is that Jesus is taking, he's bearing the wrath of God for us. That's what this beautiful word propitiation means in the New Testament, is that Jesus is bearing God's wrath. And he is taking the judgment of God that is symbolized with the floodwaters of wrath in the Old Testament. Jesus is taking God's wrath and he's removing it. He's drying it up. Jesus is, as Spurgeon says, drinking damnation dry. He takes the floodwaters of God's wrath for us. And so what Paul means in Romans chapter 6, when he's talking about baptism, he's saying that we are in Christ. And so Christ taking the judgment of God for us, going under the floodwaters of his wrath, which is meaning dying on the cross, that when we are going down in baptismal waters, in this this picture of baptism, it's we are proclaiming to the world that we have died in Christ, that Christ has died for us, that he has taken the penalty for all our sins, and he's dried it up. But Jesus doesn't stay under the water, does he? He doesn't stay in the tomb. He doesn't just die for our sins. He rises again for our justification and our redemption. And so Jesus comes up out of the grave. He comes up out of the floodwaters. And we in Christ rise again. He doesn't just die for us, but he rises again. And we rise with him in the newness of life. So what? why is baptism mentioned here as so central to the mission of the church? Because it is a picture of salvation itself. It's a picture of the gospel itself. That we go down into the floodwaters with Jesus. He takes God's wrath. He removes it. And we rise again in victorious resurrection life in Christ. Now the old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, Galatians 2, verse 20, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Friends, baptism is at the very crux of the New Testament church. Have you been baptized? If you're a believer, you need to be baptized. You need to be baptized into the local body. To be baptized isn't just your individual profession of faith. It's your baptism into Christ. And what is Christ? He's the head of a body. It's to be baptized into his bride with his people. And we are to preach the gospel and to signify and portray the gospel through baptism into this triune God who has saved us. And then in verse 20, we are to teach. Now we're to disciple them to observe all that I have commanded. It's not just evangelism. But it's discipleship. You know, sometimes we say there's this kind of unhealthy paradigm that exists in the United States. We say sometimes about a church, well, that church is really good at evangelism, but they're not very good at discipleship. Or that church is really good at discipleship, but they're not very good at evangelism. And I think we kind of all know sort of what we mean when we say things like that. But if you're good at biblical evangelism, that's going to lead to biblical discipleship, right? Right? And biblical discipleship is going to lead to biblical evangelism. And so we really can't, Jesus doesn't separate those two things here. This is part of the one package, great commission of the New Testament church. Preach the gospel, get the gospel right, get the gospel out, and then teach, grow one another. And part of being a New Testament church is that we teach each other, we encourage one another, we exhort one another, not just how to have personal interior spiritual lives, but to be people that are on mission that we as individual disciples obey what Jesus is commanding here. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded them. Teach them to be a Christian with a burden for the nations. Teach them to be a person who cares not just about going to Bible study after Bible study after Bible study, accumulating for themselves just their own spiritual growth, but teach them to be people who enter into this great commission and now are part of this army that God deploys for the sake of his name amongst all the nations. That's what you are if you are a Christian. That's what you're called to be teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Friends, I want you to see this, that the Great Commission is not some, it's not the work of a missions organization. It's not the work primarily of some parachurch 
group or the work of a missionary. It is the ministry of the local church. What Jesus is describing here in verses 19 and 20 is the ministry of Brackenhurst Baptist Church. Preach the gospel, see people converted, and then teach them how to follow Jesus so they can preach the gospel, teach other people how to preach the gospel, see people be converted, and grow them in the faith so that they can rise up and preach the gospel, see people, people be converted, and help them grow in the faith so that it happens generation. That's the ministry of the local church. This is not, this is not some Navy SEAL Delta Force special operations assignment. This is just the ministry of the local church. And Jesus is saying this is for us to do. And he promises us. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. How is he with us? He's with us through his helper, the Holy Spirit, this triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who's with us. Listen to what Jesus says about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. John 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. The helper meaning the Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Then skipping down to verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Friends, if you are a New Testament believer, if you're a born-again Christian, the Spirit of God dwells in you, and He dwells in you for something far bigger than just your own personal sanctification, as glorious and important as that is, but He dwells in us for the Great Commission. So that's explanation, application, three points of application before we end. Really, three actions that I'm asking each of you to take. Three actions that I'm asking each person in this room that is a believer to take in response to this text and to this world outreach celebration. Number one, know the gospel and commit to personally sharing it with an unbeliever. Really, let's be honest with ourselves. There's something a little off about saying we care deeply about missions and the nations if we don't care deeply about our neighbors that don't know Jesus. Don't, please don't hear this as me scolding you. I'm really not. I'm simply wanting to exhort us and encourage us. Friends, we can do this. We can do this. If you're a member of this church, you know the gospel. Well, you may need some practice and some encouragement and some, some boldness to share it, but that's okay. Maybe one of the most important things that will come out of this world outreach celebration is not just an expanded heart for the nations, but a burden for the local lost. And maybe one of the most important things that will come out of this is that a believer, a hesitant, doubting believer in this church will be more active in sharing the gospel, sharing their faith, maybe for the first time. Friends, I encourage you to know the gospel. Rehearse the gospel. And commit to personally sharing it with, the, with an unbeliever in your life. What is the gospel? The gospel is the glorious good news that God is holy and sovereign. And that he has created mankind in his image. But we have all forsaken him. We have all turned from him. We've all rebelled against him. And our sin and rebellion has brought spiritual death. But God in his kindness has sent his son Jesus. God the, God as a man, truly man, truly God, to live a perfect life, lay down his life on the cross, to bear the wrath of the Father and rise again in victory. And now he commands all people everywhere to repent and believe and trust in him. And friends, if you do not know Jesus today, you need that gospel. Your greatest need is the gospel. And right now, what the Holy Spirit says to you is to not look within yourself To not consider how you are relatively a good person compared to other people. In fact, the Bible says very clearly that you're not a good person. That there's nothing in you that can commend you to God. And actually, that's good news. Because if if it was up to your goodness, when would your goodness 
be enough to actually qualify you to God. Well, the good news is that we're not saved by our righteousness, but we can turn from trusting in our own righteousness. We can turn from our sin, and we can turn and trust to Jesus who died for all those that will repent and believe. So turn from your sin. You say, I've got some questions. So do I. Right now in faith, turn from your self-trust. Turn from your sin and put your hope in Jesus and be reconciled to God. Friends, that's the gospel. And if you're a believer in Jesus and you're a member of this church, you know that gospel. You know that gospel. And you can share it with others. And you say, well, I I don't know if I'm so good at sharing the gospel. Well, neither am I. None of us really are. None of us really are. The power is in the gospel, not in the jar of clay that shares it. In fact... Your trembling, your trembling voice as you're sharing the gospel with somebody. Oh, friends, part of that weakness I think God can use to commend the gospel, to commend the gospel. It's not about us. It's about Christ, and you get better at it, and you have more confidence, and you have more trust in the gospel. And believe me, friends, God wants to use you in personal evangelism. Spurgeon said this, If God has given you an anxiety for the souls of others, with faith, Get to work in all your feebleness. I love that. A verse that has helped me and chastened me and encouraged me to strive to share the gospel in my personal life with people around me is John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. Listen to what the gospel writer says. He rebukes these religious leaders who believed in Jesus, but they were scared to go public with their faith. John chapter 12, verse 42 and 43. Nevertheless, Many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Do you, there's going to come a day when we're, all going to, we're going to stand before the Lord. And our social awkwardness, and the embarrassment that we felt in that moment that kept us from sharing the gospel, it'll mean nothing. It'll mean nothing. Friends, let's not be people that love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. If we love the souls of people, as Spurgeon says, with faith, get to work in all your feebleness. I thank God that my my biological brother, who's three years older than me, shared the gospel with me progressively and patiently over the course of about three years. He went away to college and he came to faith in Jesus and he would come back home on his breaks and he would share the gospel with me. I thought I was a Christian. I wasn't. And he would just take every little... It wasn't a time when he sat down and he said, Brad, I'd like to share the gospel with you. And kind of, It didn't really happen like that. And that's a fine way to do it. But he just told me that he had become a Christian, that he was trusting in Jesus now which was strange to me because I thought he already was. So even that was a kind of witness to me. And then he started to live his life in front of me. And then in tidbits and conversations over the course of weeks and months and years, he would challenge the way I was living. He would challenge the things that came out of my mouth. And he would say, Brad, I think you're trusting in yourself. I think you're a sinner. And I think you need to trust in Christ. And the Lord used the faithfulness of the imperfect gospel witness of my brother to bring life to my heart. So, action number one, know the gospel and commit to sharing it personally with an unbeliever. Action number two, pray for your missionaries and the gospel mission-sending work of this church. Know your missionaries. Know that board out there with all of their pictures on it and their stories. I was so blessed by one brother who earlier in this week presented, he was a a church planter, I think in one of the townships, and he was, when he was presenting, he was talking about how Brackenhurst members messaged him regularly words of encouragement telling him that they were praying for him. And that put fuel, it was obvious, that put fuel and wings on that brother's feet to share the gospel. Pray for your missionaries. Know that God uses our prayers. He uses our prayers to bring about the completion of his mission. 
And so be a person who shares the gospel, yes, but also who prays for the gospel and lifts up your missionaries and holds the rope so that these missionaries can take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And then finally, ask the Lord what he wants of your life. Ask the Lord what he wants of your life. Let that be the the, the culminating thing on this world outreach celebration. You've heard truth, we've pondered scripture, we've thought about the gospel, we've heard glorious reports of missionaries and pastors all around the world and all around South Africa. Now, ask the Lord what he wants of your life. What he wants of your life. Now friends, I need you to know this is full disclosure. This is dangerous. Because if you, if you really ask the Lord, Lord, here am I, what would you have me to do? Where will you send me? Whether it's to my neighbors or the nation's. You need to know that God delights in answering that prayer. And God is very willing to spend our lives for the sake of His great name. But nothing is more worth than being spent and poured out for the sake of His name. Somehow in the West, we have somehow turned Christianity upside down as if it's what God can do for us to make our life more comfortable and functional and wonderful when actually it's the inverse. What can we do for the King who has saved us? How can we give away all of our lives? How can I stand on that last day? Not with a bunch of stuff and trinkets, but with my hands empty, my energy spent, exhausted for the sake of the kingdom. And friends, that is not where emptiness is found. That where is where joy is found. To stand before the Lord with nothing and saying, it's all yours, it's yours. And I I spent my life giving myself to your mission. And don't romanticize that. That can just be the regular faithful plotting of an average ordinary member at a local church whose head's on a swivel, who cares about the gospel, who centers their life on the church, who encourages others, who prays for other people, who disciples young people, who gives their life away for the ministry of the church, and they stand before the God, before God someday with a life spilled out for the glory of God. Friends, there's nothing, nothing more satisfying than that. And that's before every one of us. That's for all of us. Whether we go to the nations or we stay here and labor amongst our neighbors. That's the Christian life. It's the Great Commission. So pray and ask the Lord what He is calling you to do. Lord, what do you want me to give? What do you want me to write on that faith pledge card in a few minutes? But it's not just about giving, isn't it? Just some financial thing, as, as, as necessary as that is. Lord, what are you putting your finger on my life that needs to die, that needs to go away? What am I prioritizing over gospel ministry? What needs to change in my life? Are you calling me to go? Lord, here's my life. Use it for your glory and my joy. James 4, verse 17 says, To him who knows the good that he ought to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. I I hope this teaching has been helpful to you. But I hope beyond just my my words that I hope have been faithful and true that, that God would go far beyond that and the Holy Spirit would make application and burrow into the deep places of our heart and put His finger on our heart and say this this is what I want you to do and then that we as we sang this morning before the question and answer that we would obey that we would simply obey what Jesus commands all of his people to do to go to preach the gospel to teach them how to live for Jesus to baptize them and keep doing it and doing it until we stand before him knowing that it will all be worth it Friends, what a joy and privilege it has been to be with you this week. What a joy it is for like-minded churches to part together in gospel ministry. What a gift your friendship is to me. Thank you. I want to end with this. Friends, do you believe the good news? Are you trusting in Christ? If not, turn from trusting in yourself and put your faith in Jesus, even right now. Do not leave this building today before you've talked to 
somebody that you know to be a Christian or a pastor or elder of this church and talk to them about what it means to follow Jesus. Along those same lines, you're a Christian that's already born again. Do you, do you really believe that this applies to you? It does, friends. It applies to all of us. What would the Lord have you to do in this upcoming year and for the rest of your life, for the glory of his name? To conclude, let me read Psalm 67 and then pray it back to God for you. This great mission psalm. It says, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Let me pray this now for you as I conclude. Lord, be gracious to Brackenhurst Baptist Church. You have been gracious. Lord, continue to be gracious. Thank you for giving them such blessing, good leaders, a faithful understanding of the gospel. Lord, bless them and shine your face upon them. Give them favor. Equip them with everything they need for life and godliness and mission. Not merely for their sake, God, but that your way may be known in Johannesburg and in South Africa and in Cape Town and all across the world. That your saving power would be known among all peoples and that you would be so kind to use a church like this for more of save your saving power amongst all peoples. Lord, we pray that as a result of the ministry of this local church, more people would praise you. Let all the peoples praise you. Lord, that nations, that people groups, that have not heard about Jesus, would be glad and sing for joy because of the work and the ministry of this church. That God, this morning, this week, that you would be so kind as to use this time when we've been thinking about our responsibility for the most glorious news in the universe, that you would call people in this church to reorient their lives for the sake of gospel ministry. Maybe calling somebody into vocational service and missions, or maybe calling a person to make their life in this local church about the Great Commission, so that the peoples would praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Lord, the earth has yielded its increase. You have caused things to be the way they are and you've caused this church to be here. You have caused us to be born into this time and this place. Lift our eyes above our circumstances as if, as if you were hindered by an economy or a virus or even by the lack of my confidence in gifting. Lord, nothing can stop your hand. You will do all that you intend to do, and you delight to use people like us to bring it about. God, bless this church. Bless this church. Not for their sake, but for the sake of your name amongst all the peoples. And let all the ends of the earth fear you, because you alone are worthy of all praise. In Jesus' name, amen.